yeah. So, you know, the plan, like a lot of times it, it was like, if I go, like I just brought this big gray box with me, you know, with all my batteries in there, along with my backpack, it sucked. <laughs> to our black female landscape and nature photographers. And we have with us David Thompson for our Black Men in Outdoor Photography series. Yay! What's up, David? How are you? Good. How you doing this evening? I'm doing very well. It has been a long time and, you know, just waiting to talk with you and pick your brain about your awesome landscape photography. And so, um, going to try and just hold my my excitement okay <laughs> <laughs> well don't pick my brain too hard you might not get the answers you want <laughs> hey, I'm gonna get something that's for sure <laughs> that's a good thing good <laughs> so um first of all you're over in the Las Vegas Nevada area right yeah that's correct I've uh, been here pretty much uh the last I don't know I can't even remember I got here at the the end of 93. Um, before that, I was living in New Mexico with my parents and uh, my, mo my mother and father decided they want to retire out here. Um, They're both in the military. So um, Vegas was the uh, the spot to come to. And, you know, here, here I am, you know, all these years later. All these years later? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been a, it's been a, a long time. Um, You know, the thing about Vegas is like, you know, Back in the, you know, early 90s when I first got here, it, Vegas was really small. And mm -hmm. everybody looks at Vegas as, you know, the the strip and the the lights and the glitz and glamour and all that other stuff. But there's a whole, you know, regular community outside of all of that. And, um, you know, I've watched this community, you know, go from being really small to being huge, you know, okay. so major metropolitan city now with you know everything that's going on here so yeah it's been a it's been a, a long time it's been interesting so yeah. new mexico so correct me if i'm wrong you were when you're in new mexico or you you were close to white sands right yeah yeah i used to live in alamogordo uh, my parents both were stationed at holloman air force base um, white sands is like like my backyard i used to spend I, I can't even tell you how many times I've been there as a kid. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, you know, nothing new for me, um, you know, spending time over there, but yeah, right outside. So of with you being in White Sands and oh, I, I love White Sands National Park. It's just yeah. so pretty, that whole area, yeah. Alamogordo, all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when did you pick up a camera? <laughs> well, I wish I would have known something about photography back then when I was younger, but um yeah, my photography journey started in probably 1997-ish, 98, um, with film camera. Um, I had a Pentax Z7, um, 35 millimeter, super basic, mm -hmm. 35 millimeter film. I had a, a kit lens on there. It was like a 24 to 70 or something like that. Um, had no idea what I was doing. Didn't know anything about composition, lighting, exposure, um, any of that. Um, but what was interesting is um, being that it was film and I wasn't getting, you know, great images in, in no kind of way. Um, I was still very intrigued and interested with, with the camera. So um, why did you get the camera? I mean, what what was the but, reason... This is a funny story. So, so my father, he was, uh, he used to work for one of the taxi cab companies out here. And he was like, uh, he told my mother, he was like, yeah, you know, I found these, these two cameras in my, in my cab and I've been holding on to them for, you know, for months. And, you know, we gave it to the lost and found people and they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So they sat out there and waited for, you know, a good, like three or four months. And at this time, this was like early digital. I think there was only like a few digital, uh, camera makers at the time. And, I think Sony, Sony was one of them. Okay. And uh, he had the Sony and then he had the Pentax. And my mom, she was like, 
oh, you know, I want to get into photography, which I know she didn't. She was just saying that. So, so she's like, yeah, I want to have the, uh, the digital camera because, you know, everything comes out quick. And I was like, well, I, I want the digital. She was like, no, 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 You take the film. If you want to play with the camera, use the film camera. I said, okay. So that's how I end up getting the film, right? And in a way, it was kind of like a, like a blessing in disguise, right? Um, Why? Just, well, just being that that having that interest and having that intrigue on you know what can be done with the camera made me stick with it um because i'm just a naturally curious person in general and seeing what could be done was interesting to me i wasn't there yet but um you know over time i slowly progressed and um you know look where we are at today so what were some of the subjects that you used to capture early on <laughs> so um early on um at the time my girlfriend who was now my wife um we used to travel quite a bit back and forth to southern california because she was from orange county and I, I used to love the coast like going to the beach was like you know was always like a thing for me and you know always seeing these sunsets and you know there's always be this great you know great light I was like, man, that would be really nice if I can have a picture of that. Well, not knowing that, you know, the, the 35 millimeter camera had its limitations and, you know, not knowing that at the time, again, you know, keep on trying and, you know, you go and do these exposures and your sky is completely blown out and the foreground <laughs> is nice and exposed, but there's no detail in the sky, which, you know, again, I didn't know, but, you know, you're spending all this money on these exposures and, you know, you, you go to the the camera. Uh, the one hour photo. Yeah, you get a little one hour photo. There's a spot down in uh, Costa Mesa that I used to go to, and you know, I'd be so excited the next day, you know, to get this this uh, these uh, film. Uh, Your prints back. back. Yeah, the <laughs> prints back. And then I get the prints back, and then all of them were blown out. Uh, some of them were soft, um, you know, grainy because of the ISO, you know, all that stuff, and I never could figure out you know, why? And then, you know, like I said, just over time, you know, I started learning a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, then, do you feel that that forced you to start learning more? Well, again, it was just the intrigue, right? Just okay. the, you know, knowing that there's more that we can, that can be done because, you know, at that time we didn't, there was no social media or anything like that. Right. So anything that we saw that had pictures was like, a magazine or National mm -hmm. Geographic or, you know, something to that effect or a book. Um, so I knew that it could be done. It was just like, how, how do you get that done? So that also just kind of kept me um, interested and, in, you know, just pursuing. Um, so did you have any inclination that you would be the photographer that you are today? Absolutely not. There was, there was no, I didn't even think that was obtainable. Okay. Right. I didn't think that was obtainable. That was just kind of like a, like an afterthought. If with film, it was like, if I can get one decent exposure, that would be awesome. Um, when it came to digital, um, you know, and the progression started coming over the years, and then you you see that there, it can be obtainable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it just pursued me to go, you know, even even more. Um, and with that film, when did you get that one image with your film experience where you're like, I don't Um, I never did. Um, <laughs> I never did. I, there was one image I'll, I'll tell you, um, there was one image and I, and the, the light was, the light was horrible. I, I took it like in late afternoon mm -hmm. here at, uh, at Red Rock Canyon, which has always been, you know, like. 15 minutes away from my house. Cause I've always stayed on the West side of town. And, um, there was one image and mind you, by this time I had graduated to the, um, what is that? The slide film, like the ectochromes. Okay. So I had graduated to the slide film and I, I remember I got my images back and I got all my slides and I was looking at these images through the loop and I couldn't believe how detailed, you know, the loop was, you know, looking through the loop and seeing these mm -hmm. images. And that was like the first time where I was like, yeah, I didn't get anything good, but knowing the F-stops, you know, aperture, 
um, light, that kind of thing made a huge difference than what I was doing, you know, probably like three or four years prior to that. So yeah, I never got a quote unquote good image, but the progression was there. And again, just, just wanting more, just knowing that there's more out there, just kind of, you know, I kept on that, uh, that pursuit. So what was the next camera after that Pentax? So the next camera was a, a Rebel, Canon Rebel XTI, which okay. is funny today because I don't even shoot Canon, but that's where I started at. I started off with, you know, Canon, um, started off with a Canon uh, XTI. And and what made you decide to get that camera? My wedding photographer, believe it or not, she was like, because I told her I want to get into photography, Deborah, Deborah Simmons. I, I mean, I owe her like literally like my life <laughs> because she's <laughs> the one that got me into photography, but she was like, she said, listen, if you want to get into photography, you need to find out what you want to shoot, what subjects, which was easy for me because I already knew I didn't want to shoot people. And, you know, landscape has always been a thing for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, you need to find out what you want to shoot. Once you find out what you want to shoot, then you can start buying lenses and, you know, and that kind of thing. And then you can kind of go from there. And then at the time, she was like, if you really want to um, get a better idea, you can go online and look at a uh, Flickr. That was the only photo mm -hmm. sharing site at that time. Mm -hmm. And this was probably 2006. Okay. Yeah, that would say 2006, early 2006. And um, I went on Flickr and I couldn't believe like all the images that I was seeing. And again, you know, I get attracted to the seascape stuff because you see these great big skies and, you know, the epic light and, you know, nice slow down water motion and all that cool stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do right there. And I got the Rebel XTI mm -hmm. and I failed at that too. I wasn't Why? really the <laughs> same thing. Um, so before, before we get to that, why? So here you are with the Pentax. You yep. take your pictures. You you're not even you're not at that. Well, let me let me study aperture. Let me work with shutter speed. Let yeah. me you know my exposure triangle. You're just sure. okay, you kind of winging it. Yeah. So yeah. when you got the Canon, were you still kind of winging it there too? At the beginning, yes. Um, towards the before I went to my next camera, um, I could see the progression, but it wasn't all the stuff added up just yet um it was just like the basic stuff you know like i remember for example uh with my rebel mm -hmm. i um i didn't i don't even remember if i had a wide lens or not at the time i think i might have still had the mid zoom but anyway there was this pond there's a pond around the corner from my house so um i was doing research like crazy i would go to borders and and barnes and noble and i would sit in there for hours with a stack of books and stacks of books yeah, photography books uh, at the time it was like pop photo outdoor photographer a lot of magazines from the UK and they used to give you all kinds of instructions on f-stops and apertures and shutter speeds and you know all that stuff mm -hmm. so I would take those magazines go around the corner from my house to this pond and use the settings that they would that they were mentioning and was trying to practice like long exposures. And, you know, I, I didn't realize that the light needed to be, you know, at a certain, <laughs> you know, at a certain um, height or, mm -hmm. you know, time in the day to really, you know, get these longer exposures. But as I started studying more, I was like, oh, you know, there's this golden hour and then there's this, you know, blue hour. And I was like, oh, well, let me try that. Once I started getting that and understanding light a little bit more, things kind of started to click and take off from there. But it was a long time before it took me to get to that point. Because if I would have even known that much into the film, that would have made a huge difference. So what would your today self tell the yesterday self that you need to study with photography? Um, well, obviously patience, right? Um, <laughs> you know, if you don't have, look, here's the thing with landscape photography, if you have no patience, you're not going to be very good. I mean, that's just, that's just plain and simple. You're just not going to be, um, efficient. Um, your expectations may not be met, um, uh, without having that patience. So I would say definitely, uh, the patience, um, I think I did everything accordingly, 
you know, as far as the research and, and that kind of thing, it just was, you know, putting the two and two together to, you know, get that right image, if you will. Um, so, so when was your right image? I think the right image for me, um, probably going back to 2000, 2010, maybe. Okay. Um, took a workshop in Oregon in the Columbia River Gorge. Mm -hmm. And I took this workshop because at this point, you know, I started getting a little bit more involved with, you know, with my photography. And I just kind of wanted to see, get a baseline of where I was at. I, I said to myself, if I go to this workshop and I feel completely lost, then it's time to move on and maybe find another hobby. Um, but was I surprised with myself? You know, I was able to come back from that trip with a couple of good images without any instruction. And there was one particular scene that I shot um, in the river. Uh, it was Gorton Creek. And there was just like this one little uh, random leaf that was stuck on the rocks. Mm -hmm. And um, that particular image for me, I think was when I said, I think you got it. Because, you know, everything was there. I mean, in terms of composition, it was pretty straightforward. You know, you have a nice um, stream. Um, you're going into the background with nice filtered light you know, coming through the canopy of the trees. Um, and you got that nice slow shutter speed. Um, water texture was just right where the exposure wasn't too long, but it was long enough to give it really, really nice water texture. Okay. Um, when it came to the processing, I wasn't quite there yet with the processing, but close. And um, I think at, at that point was when I said, yeah, I think I can continue on. And pretty much from there, it was just hard work and an uphill battle with, you know, trying to stay focused with everything and wanting to know everything at one time. And um, again, going back to that patience, knowing that, um, you have to be patient and willing to accept failure. And that took a very long time to uh, grasp that concept um, of accepting failure. And once I got those things together, everything just started just kind of clicking and things just kind of took off from there. So when you decided to go to this workshop, how did you feel as a photographer with your skill level there? Did you have the Canon your, your Canon with you? Where I, you did. Got <laughs> I did. I did. I, okay, I, think so. at that time, I think at that time, I think I graduated to maybe the Canon 40D, I think at that point. Okay. I, think it was, I think I had the, either the Canon 40D or I think I might have went to my first full frame camera, which was the Canon 5D Mark II. I can't remember. It was one of those two cameras. But even then, by you know, by that time, I was like, you know, two cameras in, you know, in digital. And, you know, even then I still didn't have it, you know, fully together in terms of, you know, composition and being able to look at a scene and um, look at the light and say the light is good to do this or do that. Um, that took a, a lot of time. But at that workshop on that one particular image, that was kind of like the, the wake up call for me. So with you being at the workshop and you finally having that right image, and you didn't have any instruction, what would you attribute to the reason why you were able to successfully get that image then? You know, was it the location because, you know, you were, you've done Southern California. Yep. Was it the pressure? Because here you are at a workshop, you know, and it's like, I'm sure you spent money and it's like, ugh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, um, I think it's a combination of all of that, right? Um, the pressure of the workshop, maybe, maybe a little bit, I think that might've been probably being in the back of my head, but, um, again, just a determination to just get something, you know, just to be able to get something that you can kind of call your own and, and be like, look, I took that, you know, on my own without any instruction, uh, without any guidance. And I think that was really big for me being that you know, I was on that workshop and, you know, them, you know, I'm with my peers, you know, some of these guys already had years of experience. Um, there was um, one guy in particular on there, Justin Resnick, um, who's, you know, still a friend of mine to this day, where him and I were literally at the same 
skill set. Okay. And, um, Justin and I were, you know, he was a great guy and, you know, we were at the same skill set, if you will, but, you know, Justin has gone on to be a, a, a very successful workshop instructor and, you know, doing tours all over the world. So, you know, it was cool basically seeing our, our starting points together, you know, being at the same skill set and again, hard work. And just, you know, in their grind and just really, you know, dedicating your time to, you know, learning um, the whole, you know, craftsmanship mm -hmm. of landscape photography and handling that camera. So do you still consider yourself to be, for photography to be a hobby? Uh, well, it's not my full-time job. So, you know, it's it's kind of hard to say. It's I think the my, second hustle. <laughs> right, if you will. Um, <laughs> I think that I feel kind of weird if I call myself a professional. I've always had that, you know, that weird feeling of calling myself a professional photographer. Cause even Why? it's I, just everybody knows who David is. Yeah, but it's just weird. Like I just have weird like having this title, like David Thompson, the professional photographer. It's just weird to me. Like I because you gotta understand when I got into photography, anything that had to do with professional and making money with that camera was not even like that wasn't even a thing to me you know again like I told you it wasn't even that wasn't like not obtainable for me um and I couldn't see that as like a full-time job or anything like that I just wanted to take you know dope images I just wanted to make good imagery that was my goal from day one and even still to this day that's still my goal so you know to call myself a professional is just kind of weird to me but I will say that um I have a certain skill set that is um, pretty, pretty good. I'll say that. Okay. So I got to always ask this question because I'm sure that you've heard it plenty of times. You know, you have your camera. Everybody wants to know, well, what camera do you have? Right. Like as if the camera is, you know, just self taking the picture and you have nothing right. to do with it. Right. So when it comes to the camera or the photographer, what would you say is most important? This is really simple, Angela. This is really, really, really simple. This is what it is. Cameras are just tools. That's all they are. So anybody that's watching this or does watch this, I'm telling you now, cameras are just tools. It's like, you know, if you're in the kitchen, you got certain kind of forks, you got little ones, big ones, salad, you know, salad forks, whatever, right? Same with the, you know, type of knives that you use. Some of them are better quality than others, right? So mm -hmm. you know, maybe the cut of your knife is going to be a little bit smoother than, you know, some kind of regular steak knife. I don't know. I don't know anything about, you know, kitchen utensils, but I'm just using that as an example. They're just tools. That's, that's all it is. At the end of the day, it comes down to the person behind the camera and what their vision and what their mind sees and what they're interpreting you know with that camera what they're seeing that's what that's all it is that's it you know because period I'm, that all that <laughs> that's it i mean there's nothing else you know more to it it's really that i mean i perfect example i went on a trip this was probably like maybe it's probably like eight nine years ago okay. and at the time um i think i was making I was making a transition from my Nikon D800 to the Nikon, was it the D850? No, because that couldn't have been that long ago. I can't remember. I was making a transition to one of my systems, right? Mm -hmm. And I had sold all of my camera gear. And the only thing I had left was... Um, my Canon wide angle lens, I think it was like the 16 to 35 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, but I sold all my Canon gear. So yeah, that's what it was. I think I was switching from Canon over to Nikon. So it would have been the D800 that I was, I was going to purchase, but I had sold all my Canon gear. The, the wide lens was the only lens that I didn't sell. So I had asked my buddy to use his uh, 5D Mark II. And when I got that camera, um, it was a step back from what I had because I had the 5D Mark III and it was, you know, it was a, it was a step back in, in tools, if you will, right? Your mm -hmm. gear. 
And I took that camera to Hawaii and I only had one lens. So I was only shooting seascapes and the noise on the camera was ridiculous. I mean, even at low ISOs, the noise on it was just crazy ridiculous in the shadows, which was one of the reasons why I switched to Nikon at that time. Um, and the shadow noise in that camera and that 5D Mark II was, it was horrible. It was mm -hmm. just awful. But, but I was still able to make the normal images I can make. I just I needed to do a lot more work with blending, you know, multiple images to clean up noise and, and that kind of thing. So yes, I was able to still make decent quality images, um, but it took a little bit more work, you know, with the camera to, you know, do that. Now with, you know, the big sensor cameras and, and that kind of thing, now it's, you know, super easy and you know, I don't have to do as much work, but again, it just goes back to um, the tools of, you know, with doing our, our photography stuff, right? It's just, they're just, cameras are just the tools. It's all about the uh, person behind it and how they utilize those tools to. Exactly. So you've mentioned seascapes quite yeah. a bit as I'm talking to you. Yep. But, you know, when you look at your website, I see more than just seascapes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's funny too, because I actually, honestly, I don't even shoot the coast that much anymore. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't even really like shooting the coast to be quite honest. I mean, um, look, you know, I've kind of graduated, you know, from shooting the coast. Um, for me, um, there was, once you start, how can I put this? Let's, let's go back a little bit. Okay. So when it comes to composition, there were certain compositional elements that I like to see um, in my images. Mm -hmm. And in certain seascapes, um, there's not those compositional elements. So, you know, let's be honest, when we're looking at seascapes, it's foreground, water, sky, or rocks, water, sky. That's kind of the formula. And over you know, the period of time, like that became very formulaic to me. And as I told you before, I, I'm very intrigued and interested in other things. So it just got to a point where there was only so much I could do in the areas that I was shooting, right? Okay. In Southern California. So for me, those seascapes there were just kind of like, that was like the cutoff point. And I needed to, you know, grow beyond that. Um, as I started traveling more and going to areas like in the Pacific Northwest, um, the seascapes there and the, 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 the terrain, the landscape there is a lot different than what it is in Southern California. Right. Mm -hmm. So compositionally, those elements worked a lot better the way I photograph. Okay. Um, I, I like really strong, bold subjects, um, down south, Southern California, the seascapes aren't like that. You know, there's only a few areas that have, you know, really nice big sea stacks or, you know, decent sea stacks that, you know, can really add that, um, that 2D, 2D space. And, um, you know, up north, you know, Northern California, Oregon, Washington, you start seeing these big, huge sea stacks and, you know, the elements are a lot different. So, compositionally those were working out a lot better for me okay. um, so for a very long period of time I just wasn't shooting the coast at all now being that you know I'm a little bit um advanced with mm -hmm. my you know seeing you know the landscape um learned a lot more um being able to fill out the landscape a little bit better um I prefer those big bold structures and those sea stacks for my seascapes um so which kind of goes into the next thing is that eventually um when i update my website you'll see a lot more seascapes in there that images that i've been holding on to for you know some years <laughs> um so you you know there'll be some new stuff you know in the future but you know just for a long time i just never um was really hitting the coast like that because I just, you know, compositionally, it just wasn't, it wasn't there for me, but you know, that's changed. And, you know, okay. I'm not saying that 
you know, Southern California is just <laughs> completely <laughs> whack to, <laughs> you know, shoot these seascapes. These guys, you know, watch people are like, videos. forget it. I don't even want to watch the video anymore. Right. He hates right. California. He's, he's over here bashing Southern California coastals. And I'm not saying that, you know, the, it's, it's cool. But for me, it was just hard to, you know, come up with compelling compositions. And again, I guess that can come down to the artists and, you know, I'll be the first to say that, you know, maybe sometimes I don't see, you know, subjects the way certain people do. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it just kind of um, graduated from that, you know, over, over some years. And uh, um, again, as an artist, you just mature with the more that you see, mm -hmm. uh, the more experience, the more, you know, landscape stuff that you see, you know, it's going to tie into other stuff that you shoot, uh, you know, in photograph. So, you know, right. over that period of time, you know, I've just kind of matured past that and, you know, wanted to do other things. So that's why, you know, I don't really shoot the coast that much anymore. So what is your like dream spot to capture some images? Um, and good... let me, let me toss this in there too. If money is no object. Yeah. Right? Um, I think, I think if, you know, money is it necessarily like an uh, you know like a thing for those types of uh, trips i think it would have to be somewhere really extreme okay um, somewhere i mean in a place where not many people go mm -hmm. uh, i would say probably the poles north or south pole somewhere over there i'd probably go south i think south pole antarctica i think mm -hmm. just being that the landscape there is very rugged um which really interests me and um there's people that go down there sure but what would it look like in my eyes if i was to shoot you know if i was to capture some scenes down there you know what would it what would it look like so i would have to say probably probably far south um, okay where I would say the, the Arctic, I would think. All right. Um, and this question for you, as you know, you just mentioned, you know, capturing an image through your eyes. And we all know a lot of people can look on social media and are like, I need to go to Iceland. I, I need to go to um, the Oregon coast, you know, and it's like always like the same images, you know, yeah. just by these different photographers. So yeah. when it comes to that and capturing from your eyes, you know, do you feel that, you know, to, you know, that is important to keep up with what everybody else is doing on social media? Or do you find that you're more focused, no pun intended, right. on, on going in places that no one has heard of, but to be able to bring out the beauty of that area? Um. That's a really loaded question. You know that, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll give you a moment. <laughs> now, um, look, there's a reason why people go to these popular locations. Um, they're popular for a reason, and rightfully so. I think that depending on where you're at with your photography and you know your mindset of how you see the landscape um, is going to also... Um, determine how you capture those landscapes that everybody goes to right um the second part of that which we'll go into the you know into the first part of that question is um i don't have any expectations when i go out into the field so you know whether it be a new landscape or an older you know popular location i have no expectations um, for me it just really comes down to the light um, what the light is doing to the landscape and how I can capture that light and make a decent image, you know, what's presented to me at that time. Um, sometimes, you know, don't get me wrong, if I go to or I'm close to a popular location and I know the light's going to be really good, yeah, I might end up showing up there. Maybe. Maybe I'll get there and maybe I'll you know, try to come up with something different, which what I usually try to do anyway, but sometimes there's locations where, you know, there's just conditions there that just present itself for you to take advantage of that. Um, but then there's other times where I may go to a location and then completely, you know, deviate from where everybody is at and, you know, go out there by, you know, somewhere else by myself and find, you know, 
a different type of composition. Um, I'm, I'm known to do that quite a bit. So um, again, it's, you know, it's a two part, a two part thing for me, you know, it just really depends on the light, um, depends on where I'm at. It depends, you know, what the landscape is saying and telling me to capture, um, you know, the landscape is, has its own visual language and it's just a matter of what and how you see that language and how you want to interpret it. So, um, it just depends, you know, it just really depends on, um, you know, what's going on. Would you say that you have created or obtained the David Thompson style? Do you have? <laughs> um, <laughs> questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I, I told you to come prepared and you, you came prepared. So I appreciate that. I don't understand why you even had to tell me that. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of hard to answer because um, I think that I do have somewhat of a certain aesthetic to my work. Mm -hmm. um, for one, my work is very diverse. So, you know, I don't know if you can necessarily look at one of my images and say, oh, that's, you know, one of David's images. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. But I think for me, um, I try to keep those same aesthetics. Um, I try to be very consistent with my work in terms of processing, um, you know, compositions. I'll be the first to tell you some of my compositions aren't very complex. Um, I like very simple, kind of straight to the point. I'm very literal, literal with my work. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like it like that. I like to keep it kind of simple because I want the viewer to be able to, you know, to be able to be absorbed with what's going on in that scene. Um, I use a lot of um, a lot of lines, a lot of patterns, um, a lot of uh, contrasting colors, you know, dark and lights, um, that kind of thing. So um, smooth versus rough, you know, I like to do like a, a nice mix of elements um, in my scene. So I, I would say in those regards, maybe yes. That might be a little bit of David Thompson. That's you know, David's style. work. I see that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. But um, I think more so, I think when it comes to the processing, I think, because, you know, my processing is, uh, I would say, understated, um, not over the top. It's not, you know, in your face. It's very subtle, um, can be dramatic, can be moody, you know, again, depending on, you know, um, what the scene is. But I try to keep everything quiet you know, to, okay. to some degree, because that's just my personality as well. I'm not very, Hey, look at me, you know, I'm, I'm over here and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like in the shadows. I, I tell everybody I'm like a ninja. Like if you see me in the field, then that's saying something because most of the time I, I, I move in the shadows and I'm <laughs> really quiet and, you know, people don't see me around. Okay. Speaking of uh, moving in the shadows, um, <laughs> <laughs> what would you say was your most challenging shoot? Um, I would say, um, and you know, it's funny, I had this conversation this past weekend um, with uh, some other photographers I was talking to. And I think for me, it would be anything that's under the ground, meaning slot canyons um, slot canyons. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying this in general, not, any one specific because mm -hmm. each canyon is different but I would say the canyons be just because just because of how much work you have to put into just you know getting there and getting into some of these small spaces and there's bugs in there and I hate bugs and there's spiders and you know you get your you arms hate bugs. I hate bugs I'll be the first I hate bugs if, if if all the bugs could disappear off the face of the earth <gasps> I'd be very happy <laughs> no Oh. Yes. <laughs> Every single bug. I mean, maybe not like ladybugs. Ladybugs are okay. And moss. I'll take that. And bees. Those are the three that can stay. Everything else can just can go. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think <laughs> no that bug photos coming from David Thompson. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I think that um those slot canyons just, you know, the effort that it takes just to get into them is is one layer. The second layer is composition, you know, just being able to compose those scenes th to make sense and have a good visual flow is 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 challenging. 
Um, and then the last layer of that is the processing of these images. Like the processing is super hard because you, you're dealing with a, a transition of this bright yellow, orange reflected light transition, transitioning into red and, you know, these cool blues and, you know, subtle purples and that kind of thing. So, you know, by far, those are the hardest images, in my opinion, um, and hardest locations to to photograph. Um, so I can't help but notice over your left shoulder. Would that be the hard image right there in the back? Yeah. So so <laughs> the lady, the lady in the red dress is um, is an image that it's so funny. It's in a one of the slot canyons down in Arizona that you know mm -hmm. they actually give tours there, and it's a it's a formation that if you're not looking for it, you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, again, I just, when I'm in slot canyons, I kind of like to take my time and, you know, just kind of wander and anywhere, basically anywhere where I see reflected light, which is glow. And you can see back there that there's glow coming from the top. It radiates down into the canyon. And, you know, with that particular image, I had to like get down and I was all on my knees and my back was bugs. Oh, uh, there was no bugs. It was just dusty, you know, no bugs there. They were all scared away, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, with same thing with that particular image, you know, it was just a lot of work. And then, you know, if you were to see the raw file of that, the only thing that was present at the time of capture was just the glow, you know, pretty much the glow coming into, um, coming into the canyon. And you could see the formation um, when the light is coming in, but, you know, being able to, you know, just, you have this high dynamic range of, you know, of light and colors, um, just being able to capture that, you know, multiple images was just a, it was a, a pain in the neck and, you know, focus stacking and, you know, making sure everything is sharp. So yeah, it, it's a lot going on when you're shooting those slot canyons and, you know, that is a perfect example of, of one. Um, but no, I'm talking about outside of camera gear, you know, let's, let's touch on like your favorite tripod. Um, and let's touch on, cause you know, you're an outdoorsy person, you know, you're talking about slot canyons, being in landscape and nature photography, you're on your feet all day yeah. um, and you can be in so many different types of weather. Um, but we'll start off with tripod. What's your favorite tripod? Well, you know, the saying is this, you get what you pay for, you know, for the longest time early on, <laughs> you know, I never spent any money on any of that outdoor gear or you know boots or tripods right so I went through probably three tripods before I actually broke down and got me like a really good tripod which I have two now so I got the um the really right stuff uh I think it's a TVC 33 I have that and then I have a a Gitzo uh I can't remember the model number but it's one of the systematic tripods one of the you know the bigger ones Mm -hmm. And, you know, both of them, you know, close to a thousand dollars, which just sounds ridiculous on paying, you know, that much for a tripod. But I will say that um, I've had those tripods for years, never had any issues with them, nothing freezing up or locking up. Um, so I usually rotate those tripods depending on what I got going on. Um, the really right stuff, I use that for a lot of my travel stuff. Um you know, when I'm getting on a plane somewhere, I'll use that. Um, the Gitzo, I'll use like, you know, right now I'm not doing like a lot of traveling. It's a little bit taller than my uh, really right stuff. So I'll use that quite a bit, um, especially shooting like uh, like hills or if you're on the side of a dune or something like that. The extra length and height is actually kind of nice because you can, you know, bend the legs out a little bit further and that kind of thing. So um, <clears throat> those are the two tripods that I, I currently use. What about backpack? Uh, backpack, um, I have two, um, both backpacks that I have are, um, the F-stop bags, uh, but I have the Anja and then I have the, um, the ultralight, uh, Loka, um, okay. which I pretty much use the, the most, um, just cause it's super light. And, you know, with my gear in there, like I can get everything in there and it's still, you know, kind of like materials are okay. But again, it's made like that to keep, you know, the extra weight off. Um, if I travel, I'll, I'll use the Anja because um, again, I can get everything in there, the drone, my long lens, you know, 
and you know my basic gear i get everything in there and maybe like an extra jacket or something like that but um yeah i try to have everything all in one bag if i can so again i rotate between those two bags okay you're on your feet for a long period of time mr thompson yes What's your favorite pair of shoes or so again it goes back to you know what i was saying earlier about you get what you pay for and again, you know, I, I was buying these cheap hiking boots, you know, and some of them were, you know, okay. Like I used to get like these high tech hiking boots, which I'm not like knocking high tech, though they make some <laughs> nice hiking boots. Um, you know, I used to get some hiking boots from Columbia and again, they make some okay, okay boots. But um, when you up the amount that you pay on your hiking boots, it makes a huge difference. So now I got these, um, I got these A solo boots. Okay. Um, which those things are, they're, they're pricey, but man, those things are super nice. Gore-Tex, lightweight, cushion, breathable. Um, yeah, those things are amazing. Nice, you know, traction, good tread. Um, those are awesome. I, 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 that was, that was some money well spent. I'll say that. <laughs> um, you know, really, because when your feet are hurting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Rat. So if you guys want some nice hiking boots, look into the A Solo hikers. Uh, they got some really good hiking boots and yeah, you'll be satisfied with them. What is your um, preferred type of weather to shoot? Are uh, you the person, I mean, because, you know, like I said, we're outdoors. You have, you know, gear is important, you know, especially when I'm when referring to clothing, shoes, and are you a person where, I mean, I know you're in Vegas, so you don't have to deal with a lot of snow, but, you know, when you're traveling to the Pacific Northwest or any other places where there could be snow or any other inclement weather, yep. which one's your favorite? Uh, well, I love snow. I don't like driving in snow. If, if you can just, like, kind of transport me to a snowy location, I'd be perfectly fine if I didn't have to drive. Okay. Um, I think for me, <clears throat> I think uh, I would say kind of partly cloudy, moody-ish, I think would be my preferred um, conditions. Probably like partly cloudy to where I can maximize multiple conditions in one shoot. So okay. sunset, if I can have a nice sky that can fill the entire frame, nice texture, subtle color, soft light. Cause I love soft light. That's like the light that I love to shoot in is soft light. Um, that would be the preferred light. So like I said, again, <clears throat> I can shoot sunset, mm -hmm. get good light, get subtle color, then go to the intimate landscape small scenes with nice soft diffused light and shoot that after the sun goes down so <clears throat> that would be my preferred uh okay type of conditions to shoot in all right did you want fries to go with that order <laughs> <laughs> i mean look it is like there's a lot of times where i have gotten conditions like that you know again you know just watching the weather and you know you can kind of see like how the clouds are and um kind of get an idea of what's going on because it's like if you get that little gap in the horizon and there's nothing blocking you know wherever the sun is rising or coming or going down you know you get that so you'll get you know the light the mm -hmm. nice soft you know pastel light on the landscape like I said again which I love then you get the color after or before and then sometimes once the sun hits those clouds, the light is still diffused, so you can still shoot. So, you know, it's like a combination of things. So I can get like, you know, I can just eat all my cookies at once. <laughs> <laughs> Next question for you um, before we start to kind of wrap things up. You uh, fly the drone. Yeah, yeah. What made you get into aerial photography? Um, curiosity. Um, I think at the time, in fact, it's kind of funny, I'm again, going back to my website, because that's all I've been doing. I've been doing a major, major overhaul in my website. Um, I mean, it's basically going to be brand new, if you will. Um, and I was um, doing the files for the drone. And I first started, my first drone flight was in 2016. 
And, um, you know, it was a funny story. I had a client that I was doing um, some post-processing with and he had uh, these drone files and, you know, I had, had heard these things about the drone files, you know, people saying that the files weren't that good and can't really process them and this and that. So, you know, during our session, he brought up some drone files and this was like with the, the very first Mavic. And I think it was like 12 megapixels or 13 or something like that. Okay. Um, we got to playing with the files and the files were actually totally usable um, if you knew how to process them right. And they were definitely usable. And I was like, man, I was actually, you know, surprised. And he was like, well, if you want, you know, you can next weekend, you know, you can go fly to, you can go fly my drone. I was like, okay. So the following weekend. Had you flown before? No, never, never touched a drone in my life. So I, I was like, okay. So he showed me a couple of basic functions and, you know, I flew it for like five minutes and I was like, like I said, I'm getting a drone like today, like literally today I flew for five minutes. I gave him back his controller. I didn't even fly a full battery or anything. And I didn't shoot anything. I just, you know, flew around, moved it a couple of times. I gave him back his controller because I didn't want to crash it. And I said, I'm going to go order me a drone today. And after we got done, I went home and I ordered the Phantom. I think at that time it was a Phantom four when it just came out. And, um, that's where the drone, you know, journey began. And, you know, I've been flying since, like I said, 2016. And um, the thing with the drone, and again, for me, like I told you, I'm just always curious. And the thought process was this. There was a couple of my close friends that were already flying a drone. Two, only two guys at that time was uh, Alex Noriega and uh, Kane Egelbert. Um, those are the only two guys that were flying the drone and they were doing abstracts, um, you know, abstract patterns mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing um, up in Utah. This would be way before anybody even people even got into this stuff yet. And um, and I was like, yeah, that was cool. I go, that's something different. But I go, but think of it like this. We're at our tripods and, you know, just the average person, you know, is know let's just say five feet and some inches right um man six foot and some change so technically we only have you know uh up to maybe six and a half feet you know vantage point of the stuff that we see in front of us you know on a, and stuff on a tripod but what happens if you change that perspective to 15 feet or 20 feet right um let's see how that perspective can actually change the landscape. And um, that was the the motivating factor for me is that just the possibilities out there were, you know, were endless that if you go to certain locations and you want to get up a little bit higher, you know, the drone would be perfect for that. And, and yes, I did start off with a lot of the abstract stuff, but, you know, again, it's like I was talking about earlier, you, you mature, you start getting a clearer vision of stuff that, you know, you see and can do uh, with the tools that are given to you. And from there, it just like, it just took off for me. And um, I will say like a lot of my drone work is super unique. You're not going to see the perspectives that, that I have um, some of those abstract images that I've done, you know, likewise. So, you know, it was really taking, you know, the photography to a whole nother level um, it also, um, opened the opportunity to, you know, see and do a lot more, you know, stuff, uh, aerial wise and, and that kind of thing. So, um, that I think for me was really eye opening and has been such a, a, a great experience. Um, so you know, those drums you, and stuff. You have, I'm so curious that phantom when it comes to traveling is yeah. not travel friendly. It wasn't. <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't travel friendly at all. Um, yeah. So, you know, the plan, like a lot of times it, it was like, if I go, like I just brought this big gray box with me, you know, with all my batteries in there, along with my backpack, it sucked. Um, hiking with that, it sucked, but you know, Say how we, you really feel. Yeah. It was, it, it was bad. This, I, if I could curse here, I, I probably would say a little bit more, but I'm going to keep that, uh, keep that PG right now, but, 
Um, it did suck. And, you know, once I switched over, cause now I got the Mavic, the Mavic two pro, um, which is perfect for me cause it's small, it's compact. It's, you know, mm -hmm. simple, you know, files are good. You know, everything is working there for me. So, um, that was a huge upgrade just, you know, with the size stuff, but I will say that the Phantom was super nice when it came to windy conditions, you know, it handled wind, um, like nobody's business, um, made a lot of images with that, that Phantom 4. <laughs> um, workshops. Yes. And organizations. Yes. Now I have to bring up, um, Keisha and I were in a workshop last year, the Outsiders. Yep. And this was, I think, shortly after, um, being aware of your photography and interacting with you on social media. Yep. And one of the attendees at the Outsiders Photography was talking about, I don't know how we got on the subject. And she's like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm gearing to go to a, um, a workshop with um, this photographer named David. Yeah. And me being who I am, I'm like, David who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she mentioned David Thompson. Yeah. Who's that guy? Come up and we're here in the middle of Kanab, Utah at this yeah. organization. Yeah. And Keisha and I were the only two people of color there. And then yeah. here's this lady just talking about going to a workshop with you. Right. So you do one-on-one -on -one workshops? What is, what is this about? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I do one-on-ones. Um, you know, look, I, like I told you before, I fly under, I fly under the radar. I try to keep You everything. sure do, but you know what? Ever since your name just pop up, I'm like, who is this? It's like the whiz. Like <laughs> <laughs> nobody beats the whiz. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, look, like I said, I, I fly under the radar. I keep everything low key. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on social media. I don't, you know, I don't advertise super crazy for the workshop stuff and I do do them. I, I do, you know, provide them, um, mentoring, um, Skype sessions for post-processing. Um, I do, I do all of that stuff. Um, but again, it's not like a whole business model for me because the yeah, thing is, yeah. this: so there's a lot of nuanced stuff with that. You know, I like to talk about composition, what works, what doesn't work, um, trying to get those connections with the landscape you know, and, and how you're seeing it and, you know, how you're um, visualizing it. Maybe I can add an extra layer to that to help you break it down even more. So, so those if somebody are, wants to have a workshop with you, you just do one-on-one -on -one or small group? I do small groups. So usually like the max I do is three people, you know, and every everybody that's done them with me, um, <laughs> everybody that's done them with me has been... Uh, <laughs> three people. <laughs> <laughs> that's been uh you know really satisfied because it is some really easy going super laid back um you know and again i just want people to learn um if you really want the experience uh, you know i'm i'm that person to uh to hire if you want to experience that well that's 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 good to know and good to hear because um going into my last question we don't see many people of color yeah. out in this genre and um you know, it's like now meeting people and us having these interviews that's on our YouTube channel and bringing more attention to that we are actually out here. We um, out here. And out here. <laughs> <laughs> we out here. We're, we're seen. Yeah. Um, even, you know, to the fact that, you know, here I am, like I said, I'm in Utah and right off the rip right there, people are like, you, you as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. when it comes to um, not seeing people of color, what does it mean to you for that? Because quite honestly, every workshop or event that I went to is like, where y'all? Yeah. Anybody yeah, go? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I got, I got so many thoughts on that. I'll just kind of give you like a, you know, kind of like a simplified, you know, breakdown of that. So I've been doing this a long time. Um, you know, I've traveled a lot and seen a lot. And, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and it kind of bums me out that here it is. I've been doing this 
I don't know, digital stuff, 14 years or so. And in my experiences, I can count on one hand how many people of color, black men that I've seen out in the field. And I can tell you three, three of them, when I saw them, they were both, we were both surprised to see each other. He was surprised to see me and I was surprised to see him. And, um, you know, it, it really, it's really telling when, you know, here it is in 14 years that I've only seen less than five black men out in the field when it comes to landscape photography. Um, I think it's unfortunate. And, you know, there's so much out there to see. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, you know, social economic, um, how people are raised, you know, they're not being exposed to, you know, the outdoors, right? So it's just kind of like, how do they know? I mean, I'm sure you've had friends family members you tell them where you're going and they're like you're going where and why right um but they don't you know they don't get it right until they actually get out there right and you can kind of share that experience with them with you know with your imagery or you know if they're fortunate enough to go with you on one of those trips they can experience that for themselves that's the thing that i want to see more of is more of you know people of color women black women you know, um, going out into the field and, you know, exploring and, and, and getting experiences with nature and, you know, bugs and all, you know, nasty ass bugs and all, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, like, you know, especially with, you know, with, um, black women, um, I would love to see more black women as, you know, landscape photographers like yourself and, you know, Keisha and, you know, you know, some others that, you know, are in that small circle, but I want to see more of that, you know, and uh, um, there's just so much there to offer. And, um, you know, I think it's, you know, saying something where, you know, people like us are out there doing what, you know, our counterparts are doing. So, you know, I think that's a, a really big thing. And I, I would love to see more of that. Um, you know, for me, I think too, is that, you know, I have the most common name, David Thompson, but yet I'm a black man. <laughs> so I'm easily recognizable when I'm out there in the field, but you know, it shouldn't just be me. It should be, you know, a lot, a lot others, a lot more people out there like me out there and, and doing this, but, um, you know, hopefully in time with, especially now with social media and, you know, with, you know, seeing more of us out there like that. And, you know, maybe that will, you know, maybe that will be a change and maybe there'll be that shift. Um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Sooner like than later. We're, it's now 2023. Yeah. yeah. We need to be out there. I mean, it, it, we just do. And I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of us, you know, there's a lot of us black folks out there and, and we need to um, be out there in more capacities with, you know, with, without having that urban environment, you know, around us. So we need that, you know, we need to, whether we need to, you know, start teaching that more in schools or, you know, people like you and I start sharing more images or, you know, just kind of reaching out. I don't know. I don't know what that, you know, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what we need to do um, to make that happen, but something, you know, we need to have something that's going to encourage people to want to go out there even more. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David, for your time, for your advice, for your sharing of your photography and your experience. It is so appreciated. And for our people that are watching, please make sure that you like, subscribe, share, comment, share, subscribe, share. All share. of that. Hit you know, the little, you know, the the subscribe button at the bottom. The I'm, not even, I'm not even on YouTube, and I even know that you got to hit the subscribe button. I mean, come on, guys, you know, hit the subscribe button and share. Come on, do all of that. And if you are interested, which you should be, check out David's website. Um, we have all his information in the comment section of this video. So please go over there to his site. You have his Instagram, all of the super, the social media handles where you can look him up. And like we mentioned, he also does workshops. So you guys hit me up if you guys want to learn some stuff. I got you. There you guys have it. All right. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.